Today's day and age, um, like you use Vietnam as an example, um, the American public or the press want immediate results, and that's why, um, is that not a reason why? Let me go back, since I talked about that earlier, you're, you're on something, I think it's an, you're on an important uh, comment there. <clears throat> Remember when I said earlier, in the, I don't know, a couple hours ago, I made a comment, I said, I'm answering you, I just wanted to go back to some other information. I made a comment that where Weinberger said, you know, we're not going to get any more conflict unless we have the support of the American people. Remember that, but you're, you're touching on this right now. And then I went back and said, yeah, but in Vietnam, when we started that, where we had the support of the American people, again, which raises the question, what happened? Why did we lose it? What's the thing you're touching on? So what happened? Why did that fall off the train of late? Because we put out, I'll tell you what happened. You look at it. We put out all these phony reports all the problems we were making. The press got wise that started printing it back in this country. Plus the fact, remember, we had that one-year rotation pulse. People going over and back, and they're coming back. All those, their comments say it's not working. It's confusing throughout our society. We couldn't stop it. Because the guys are coming back, they're even talking about it. So now we have a mismatch between the government is saying and the events that they're playing out. Support went right to the floor. You've got 11. World War II, nobody said that war was going to be over early. In fact, Churchill said blood, sweat, and tears. Couldn't even promise them victory. We were having, we really made them, the enemy look bigger than they were. He said, God damn, we're going to have to work this problem, otherwise we're not going to make it. We in Vietnam knew we had all the resources. We were on top. We didn't call up the reserves. Didn't get everybody's support. Plus, we started lying when our goddamn progress wasn't going good. El Tubo. Why do you lie? Do you think huh? we had a little disinformation going on from the other side? Yeah, but we come to that. You're always going to have that. Everybody says, you know, the Russians are always pumping out this information. You think we go around the world and tell the truth to everybody? <laughs> we didn't even tell the truth to our own people. We said we were succeeding when we were. <coughs> that's disinformation. No, I know that's not pleasant to hear, but that goes on. You've got to face up to it. I'm trying to tell you. You don't, you don't correct your mistakes. Why did that happen originally when the people were still behind the information? Remember, they, they, what about the, what, let me go back. One point before I hit you, I hang on to your question. Let's go back an example. I know it's hard to accept. Let's go back to Divac. The Army went out with a blessing of the Pentagon. They put this tape out. They didn't give a copy to Denny Smith. Which they showed these drones going exploding in the areas. Look at that thing's hitting accurately. They forgot to tell the guys they were command destructing those from the ground. That's disinformation. But then when he was told that happened, he came unglued. And he should have. Then the word got out, the whole press got it, they command destructed those drones. End of that. So don't say we don't pump out disinformation. We do. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have deception in war. You may need it. But it goddamn well better work, and you better understand what you're doing before you get into it. It's going to be there. But when you're in a situation where it's going to drain out over time and you're putting this stuff out, you know, that's eventually going to get out. And particularly so when we had these one year tours, people are going there and coming back and saying, geez, this is sucked. And they're talking, and of course, they're talking to everybody and their friends, and the press is over there getting them freezing, the whole thing come on ground. Yeah, an example would be if you put out information on a poll that wasn't true, and there are three or four other polls come out there just diametrically opposed to what your campaign has done. Second, yeah, they're not too good. Particularly if they look into it and say, geez, this is a, this is a rigged poll. It's a phony device. Because they'll start going, well, how did they poll? What were their techniques? Found out it was a, took a narrow sample or something, or what do you call a selected group, in order to make it look good. In other words, rig, rig the poll so you get the results you want. Just like you rig the test so you get the results you want. And you've got to be very careful. I'm serious about it. In the instance you were talking about uh, the real warfare going after the moral. Uh, Incidentally, you know, that doesn't mean the other guy's done it all right either. I'm not saying that because of course you make these you really, when you're thinking, you've got to think about these things. Go ahead. And you were referring to the statements by General Blight. Uh, by who? Blight. Blight. I mean, excuse me. Blight. 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 
Oh, okay. I didn't even get the wrong. <laughs> He's the guy I talked to. <laughs> uh, he said that as an effective, as, as an effective commander, you need to, you know, inspire your men and then give them a mission and let them go do it. Uh, we got in trouble. Now. We got in trouble last time we did that back in 1972. Okay. Now, if you're going to do that, you know what I said? I made something, I made something very important. You did say be prepared to stand by them. Well, but I said something else. And if you're going to do that kind of thing and let them do it, that suggests them. I didn't say suggest them very strong. You better have that common outlook so you understand the kind of things they're going to be doing and the constraints you're going to have upon that yeah. rather let them do it. And they didn't Without get in trouble for outlook. breaking into the Democratic headquarters the wrong way. They got in trouble because they weren't supposed to be in there. Yeah. And you're right, like cultural. And yeah. you're, you're in this country, that sort of said, you know, you really should do that. Well, we got carried away with the game. Well, yeah, you, but see, you're in the United States, and even whether you're one political party or another, or you're one aspect of society, there's certain cultural constraints upon you that are looked down upon. And if you violate that, of course, if you don't get caught, you might be all right, but if it gets caught, all of a sudden, you're deep yogurt. They might have thought, well, hell, we're going to make it, make it free, but they didn't, and they paid the price. Got to keep those things in mind. Back to you. Well... Originally, the support of the people in behind the Vietnam War. So, so was it part of a strategy to put out this information? Was it some grand plan that they had? They thought they had to do that, or what was the purpose uh, behind the misinformation? Well, if you're going to support, if you're going to get in war, you know, relative to your adversary, and you want to pump out disinformation or misinformation, or allow him to draw his own incorrect conclusion when you're operating. But on the other hand, if you're going to be in operation, you say, boy, we really need to support the American people. And we say, you know, this, these guys, uh, we don't even have to call through. Look at how they didn't call through reserves. And uh, they said, we can operate this economy, you know, full blow, plus we can fight that little, that wasn't even a war, just a two bit thing over there. And my one year tour, well, if that's the case, we know. How come we get this? See, one of the, that's one important thing, why the draft, I think it's important. I know it's unpopular. The draft and calling the reserves, what you do when you do that kind of thing, see, the people they say, hey, this is kind of serious. And then don't underplay what you can do. They say, we really got to pull this one together. Another thing, by having a guard, calling the guard and reserves, well, that seems to work. In fact, a large, I think a large portion of force should be guard. Because, you know, the the Garden Reserve has very strong moral ties to their local community. And if you've got to support the people and bring them up, see, that tends to, that tends to solidify that you keep it together. And if you do that, you know, then you, you, have, you have a greater option for playing deception here. Because now people want to say, oh, we've got to be careful, we can lose this thing. It might just look like a bunch of jerks. So you bob and up with this really no great thing. You have the Cadillac, you have this, and you have the war going. In World War II, there was no doubt. Everybody knew, hey, you know, we may not make it. So we better really lean into this. I remember very vividly. You know, we had ration cars, couldn't get gas, couldn't get this. <coughs> of course, we had, a, we had an opponent where that was easy to do, a guy by the name of Adolf Hitler. That helped a lot. Yeah. So if you, make your, if you make your opponent look like Hitler, you got a lot going for you. Well, it's got to be compelling. Let's see, the point is, when we went in there with the support of the American people, then we pumped out all these phony stories of how we were doing, and it wasn't paying off because we wanted to be able to show progress. If they, they may have put it out for initial conference, but if they really saw that was going bad, they better start. They start re, better replay that music and replay it in such a way that you know you can always structure stuff. So you say, look, you know, granted, this thing's covered. We have, and you might even be able to get more support. But you have to be very careful when you do that. I'm serious. You really do. But if you keep trying to hide it when it knows otherwise, and you keep digging in your heel, it, it's going to pull you down. It'll just pull you down. 
on the other side of it, if you're your polling thing, Carlisle, if you pump out and say that your poll was worse than it actually was, at that point now you're starting to get inside these people. Say that loud. You're saying something very important. I want, I, want to, I want to amplify that. You're saying something very important. If, for instance, you get a poll and you're, say, 45% or something, and you have a press conference and say that you're only at 35%, the other guys are looking at that poll and say, wait a second, what kind of poll is that guy looking at? That sets them to thinking what's going on and confusing them. Let me give you another aspect. I'll let you in a minute. There's, there's, one of the things that we've done to people I've operated against, and some people have a hard time doing, once they see they have success, they want to take every little bit of it. I said, wait a minute, you know, the, the data is not that active. We know that. I'm talking about like an engineering and airplane kind of say, look, let's, let's understate it, goddamn. We know no matter how we look at it, this is okay. Yet it feeds our case for the argument we're trying to poke. So let's understate it. Then what happens when you do that, you make your case, the other side is going to check it out. When they find out you understand it, Christ, it demoralizes okay, Which is another aspect of the thing you're saying. But there's different ways that can be done. <laughs> okay. Let me change something. I want to change the change of the discussion here entirely to a different subject. Um, because it's a problem that I've, I've encountered in campaigns. We're talking about entropy, uh, which is kind of the natural disillusion of everything. That's the way it goes. <laughs> That's kind of what campaigns are. They kind of organize chaos. Yeah. Um, and it seems sometimes it's very hard to get any rigidity in, in an organization so to, to try to make it function and do certain things. At the same time here, we're trying to be as flexible as possible. Um, and that seems almost contradictory in the fact that, for instance, if you're trying to put together a literature drop, for instance, I mean, that takes a lot of organization and planning and you've got a lot of people running around that have never done a literature drop before. And so there has to be some rigidity of function. Okay, know what you said. A lot of people have never done that before. What did I tell you about before about common outlook and that kind of stuff? I said, if you don't have a common outlook, you're going to have to have more detailed instruction or people haven't done things before. Remember what I said about the ball? As you remember, he said, if you're division commander, you may have some people in there that you can give them a long leash and they can do it. Other people, you better watch carefully, they're going to get you in trouble. And that's exactly what you're talking about right now. Now, politically, since the campaigns operate over, you know, as far as a short period, of course, nowadays, I don't know if they're short anymore or not. <laughs> uh, and there's new people flooding in. Uh, you have that problem. But on the other hand, the military, who might have been there for years, are transferred in and out of but they still adopt rigid attitudes. I think you people are more flexible. Uh, <coughs> it seems to me that you've never been political. Just from the comments and the remarks. Of course, some people may not be good. Of course, they're not flexible enough. They may not be around after a while either. <laughs> Political. But I think, you know, this is the thing. It's a common outlook. So if you have a real good shared outlook with certain people, you don't have to give them a lot of instruction. Some, certain people I work with, you know, we work together so long in different enterprises, I just get on the phone a couple of words and I just hang up. I know it's okay. And I say, just check back and tell how it's coming. He'll say, it's going this good enough press. You always want that feedback. But that doesn't mean you want to give a person detailed instruction. You always want to keep getting feedback. Just enough to be sure you know what's going on. And the guy you have to understand is there's a certain trust, there's a certain form. And you have to face up to it. If it's not going right, and that's one of the hardest things I've had to teach people, if it's not going right, face up to it right now. Because we can look at it. You wait, it may be too late. You look at it and say, look, we can redo it. It's not the fact that, you know, it doesn't mean goof per se. This might have been, you didn't assess correctly, some of us may have missed it. Well, you see, okay, yeah, well, you, know, you, you begin to reconstruct. But well, you wait too long, you're in a bag. It's too late. And that's why it was informal. I talked about those informal loops. One informal loop. So, because what you're doing by having those informal loops, you're not only getting your formal perspective, you're getting other perspectives, and then you can start matching together, see if they, they tie together. So you can get a better overall image of what's taking place. I used to encourage my people, well, you know, beat the bushes around the Pentagon. I didn't know where they were. Beat the bushes, have a ball. As so long as we understand what we're about, let's not play some dirty game. Thank you. Any more? Thank you.